Good morning and welcome to today's virtual conference on deputies in schools hosted by the Civilian Oversight Commission. I'm Danielle Butler Vappi, the interim executive director for the commission. For those of you who may be joining us for the first time, our commission consists of nine appointed volunteers from the community and eight county staff members who research, analyze, and provide recommendations related to the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department's practices, policies, and procedures. Our commission is advisory, so our recommendations are implemented at the discretion of the Board of Supervisors and the Sheriff's Department. Today, we're discussing the School Resource Deputies Program in the Sheriff's Department. School Resource Deputies are sworn law enforcement officers whose duty it is to protect students and faculty and to secure the campus and improve school safety. This is the final session in a series of educational conferences on this topic. To watch videos of past sessions, please visit our website at coc.lacounty.gov. Our moderator today will be Commissioner Luis S. Garcia, who leads our Commission's Quality of Life Ad Hoc Committee. This committee is gathering community feedback about the topic of deputies in schools, and Commission staff uh, is coordinating a series of roundtable conversations with various school district community organizations and members of the public. If you or someone you know may be interested in participating in these roundtable discussions to share your experiences and provide thoughts about deputies in schools, please reach out to us. You can do that by emailing us at cocnotify at coc.lacounty.gov. We also invite your written public comment which our staff and commissioners will review as they analyze the issue and assess providing recommendations to the department and the Board of Supervisors. Again, you can do that by visiting our website at coc.lacounty.gov to complete the form to provide your comments. The deadline for submitting these written public comments is August 7th. We have a great panel of speakers lined up to describe ensuring outcomes and accountability of deputies in schools. Today, you will hear from Baron Gardner, who is a teacher in the Antelope Valley Union High School District, followed by National Association, Association of School Resource Officers President Rudy Perez, and Jewel Forbes, who is the Project Director of Mental Health and School Counseling for the LA County Office of Education. Lastly, we have Amir Whitaker, who is a Senior Policy Counsel for the ACLU. Thank you guys for joining us today. And now I'll turn it over to our moderator, Commissioner Garcia. Thank you, Danielle. And thank you everyone again for joining us here today. My name is Luis Garcia and I am a member of the Civilian Oversight Commission. And I work as a statewide behavioral health mental, behavioral health consultant, helping public and private mental health substance abuse providers to improve California's behavioral health system infrastructure. I also volunteer as an associate clinical social worker, where I specialize in working with people with mild to moderate mental illness. As Danielle mentioned, I lead the Commission's Quality of Life Ad Hoc Committee. So I, along with Commissioners Irma Cooper and Hans Johnson, are looking into the topic of deputies in schools. The Commission has heard public comments about the issue for years, and we've had community organizations and the Office of Inspector General provide presentations to the Commission on the topic. Now we are doing proactive outreach to learn what various stakeholders think about the topic. The Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department School Resource Deputies Program has contracts with various school districts to provide services on school campuses throughout Los Angeles County. In the last session, uh, Balancing Safety and Equity, I heard a range of perspectives on school resource deputies in school settings. I was particularly intrigued with hearing panelists Linwood Unified School District Board of Education uh, Vice President Gary Hardy Jr., who, sh who shared about how by investing in outcomes for students as opposed to school deputies, the district was able to improve its graduation rate at Linwood and Fireball High School. Today's panel will highlight the goals of school security and how district schools, parents, and students can work toward improved outcomes for students and ensuring accountability for all. While we work to refine the best practices to ensure safety on school campuses, it is important to prioritize students' successful outcomes and focus on accountability. This session will highlight best practices for hiring and maintaining appropriate staff, including security and other services. 
We will also check with teachers to ensure that programs intended to protect them as well as students are meeting those goals. Today, I hope to learn more about ideas for improvement as well as streamlining efforts to ensure that best practices are implemented across all schools. As always, following speaker comments, we will have a question and answer session. So if you have a question for the panelists, raise your hand in WebEx. And now turning it over to today's speakers, although we've told you the names and titles of the panel speakers, I invite each of you to introduce yourself, including your preferred pronouns and a little bit about your background, if you wish. Without further ado, I will turn it over to our first speaker, Baron Gardner, who is a teacher. Thank you for all the work you do, and please uh, go ahead, Baron. Hello, name is uh, Baron Gardner. Um, 20 year veteran educator, been in the district for about uh, about 15 years. Um, <clears throat> I've, uh, you know, have some history um, in this uh, in this area. Um, the Stop Mass Incarceration Network, uh, worked with a group of teachers, Alliance for Black Student Equity, and um, uh, pretty yeah, pretty much uh, and pretty much that's it. And work with uh, committed uh, community groups like uh, you know, cancel the contract and so forth. So um, here we go, man. Sheriffs and schools, COC uh, virtual conference. I know I only have about ten minutes. Let me know if I'm uh, if, if I'm moving too slow or need to speed up. Need to speed up. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm just gonna go point by point and address the. Um, uh, Number one, the scope of SRBs, that's a student, excuse me, school resource deputy, uh, scope of work, responsibilities, protocols, and procedures outlined by LASD or school districts. Um, this was a little bit uh, difficult, um, given that there were, uh, you know, school officials and leadership gave different descriptions of the role and responsibility of the SRO. Sometimes I'm going to use those interchangeably. Um, so I apologize. I, I know this right now. It's SRD in the title and SRO, and uh, <clears throat> in my response. Um, so these inconsistencies show a lack of overall clarity um, around the procedures and stuff in regards to the re referral of students to the um, to the SRO um, and the service agreement um, between the district and the um, and the sheriff's department. It's very vague. It doesn't include any details on the actual scope of work um, of the SROs. It's very, very vague. Um, it says to uh, you know in, enforce the law. Um, so it, it really doesn't. Um, we really don't have much to work on, and you know, uh, much to report in terms of protocols and procedures. Um, a lot of this information is coming from, as you see right there. There's a link: Disability Rights California investigative report. Um, so I wanted to wanted to have it there so uh, people can have access to it. Uh, hit the next uh, screen, please. Um, so um, there are there is a training. I understand there is a twelve hour training by the LS, uh, LASD, um, which includes, uh, to my understanding, no trauma informed practices. Um, and I also feel that the uh, the school district should have some input on how LASD deals with the minors. The training is done uh, by the sheriffs. Um, Next screen, please. <clears throat> so data on SRD program outcomes, instances of effectiveness or areas where the program is falling short. Again, this is kind of difficult as well because there's some inconsistency in terms of even the reporting. Um, we have under reporting by the sites to the civil rights data collection. Um, so there was, um, you know, the review identified a total of 354 unduplicated law enforcement referrals, um, which is 82.6% more law enforcement referrals than, than reported as part of the uh, civil rights data collection. So the civil rights data collection isn't getting all of the, um, all of the information, all of the referrals. Um, but based on what we do have, we know that uh, Black students show the highest risk of law enforcement referrals um, <clears throat> for all non-disabled students, okay, um, at a rate of almost, you know, four. <clears throat> um, students with disabilities are 3.7% of law enforcement referrals, um, but Black students with disabilities 
are the most affected group. Black students with disabilities make up 61.4% of all law enforcement uh, referrals. And, you know, given that this is, uh, you know, this is a, a you know, these are largely special ed students, you know, and they, they need, is this, is this the help that, that we want to, that we want to offer them, introducing them into the, the criminal justice system? Um, next, uh, next screen, please. Um, again, um, inconsistency in, um, in reporting. Um, the district provided a list of 27 students arrested, taken into custody and removed. Um, consisting of 12 GE students and 15 special ed students. Um, a comparison of lists provided showed 20 of the students reported being removed, failing to appear on the law enforcement list. Okay, um, so um, of the 34 removals that could be verified, um, black students um, with and without disabilities make up half of these removals, black students with disabilities uh, comp comprising 60% of all students with disabilities removed. Uh, next, uh, next screen, please. Okay, um, so reporting inconsistencies obscure the true practices of schools, <clears throat> excuse me, of schools related to law enforcement referrals, arrests, and removals. Okay, um, we had a situation where a student, <clears throat> a special ed student, it said that, um, you know, a, a, he was supposedly only had a, uh, a conference, but um, the, the suspension documents included a uh, BER, which is a behavioral emergency report and an incident report indicated that student had been restrained, arrested and taken into custody. Um, it, uh, the, the incident also took place in May. Um, however, it was not, uh, the, excuse me, the, um, the report was not taken until August, okay, into August. So, you know, we, we have some, uh, some unfortunate lapses in terms of reporting. Uh, next screen, please. So, uh, guidance for implementing more effective security precautions while not deterring student learning. Um, just you know, just looking at the campus when I when I when I looked at this question, um, and I thought about security, I, I, I thought about you know what me as an educator, what I what I see the biggest threats of security are often on campus, um, you know, fighting amongst the fighting amongst the students. Um, that that seems to be why a lot of students seem um, feel unsafe. You have you, we do have a lot of. We do have violence and students fighting, man. But I think um, if we were able to provide some access to activities during non-instructional times where the fighting is taking place at lunchtime, after school and whatnot, um, we had um, right at, uh, at AV High School, we had a program, uh, Mr. Jim Patterson's program, man. They had games, big old Jenga, big, uh, uh, what was that, Connect Four, chess board, dominoes out, uh, cornhole, jump ropes. Um, they, I hardly saw any, <laughs> I don't think uh, the three on three basketball tournaments, I've never seen any fights during any of these uh, when we've had these activities. Um, and I just think kids should have more access to the activities. There's also a, um, a security, uh, uh, probably we're low in security. So much of the campus isn't even accessible. The basketball courts aren't accessible because you know we don't have the security to man the area. So um, if we were able to, have more stuff for kids to do it may cut down on the on the fightings and the violence conflict resolutions peer mentorship uh, mediated discussion early identification of students for targeted assistance and mentorship um, we should know who the kids are coming are who kids are coming in um, and be able to hook those kids up with mentors and peer mentors um, increase training in de-escalation tactics campus-wide oftentimes the presence of the sheriffs or even security um incites uh it, you know it um how do i put this here um it, it can escalate the situation okay and also the presence the very presence of an officer can be triggering um you know um you know <clears throat> we want to definitely want to discuss not having the cops on campus at all and if they are there do they have to wear the police uniform with the big old gun there are other um districts where you know the the uh the sro has a, a you know a polo shirt you know 
Um, other other districts have it where they, you know, are, are around the perimeter of the school and not necessarily, you know, in an office or walking around campus. And we should also clearly define the role because um, the role is not very clearly defined at all. Go ahead and hit the next one, please. Um, so areas to differentiate the allocation of duties related to perimeter security, discipline related incidents, law enforcement matters. Again, there's only vague, vague language in regard to their responsibility for per perimeter security anyway, um, or disciplinary related incidents. Um, they have the power to inter intervene in disciplinary related incidents, but their responsibility is, you know, how it actually works is the, um, the student is turned over to the officer by either administration or um, or security. Okay, now they can intervene, but they're only responsible, you know, for arresting students and dealing with students when they uh, when they break the law. Um, it's the campus security that primarily handles perimeter security. There's only one officer on campus. Um, and disciplinary cons uh, consequences are generally given out by teachers or administrators. Um, once an officer is, is, is involved, that, that disciplinary infraction can turn into a criminal offense. A fight turns into, you know, can turn into assault or, you know, um, uh, defiance can turn into, you know, into something else. These, these schoolyard things can turn into actual criminal offenses. Uh, next screen, please. <clears throat> process for school staff to initiate calls for service and identify common reasons why school staff call for SRD intervention. Now, the staff generally don't call the, de the deputies. Me as a teacher, I don't, I don't generally call the de deputy. Um, I can send the school, uh, if I'm having trouble with a student and I need them out of the class or her out of the class, I can send the students to security, the student success center, which is the PBIS room, or I can refer them to uh, to administration. Okay, the students are then turned over to the deputy by one of those parties. Um, however, there have been reports of teachers calling for security and the deputy shows up with security. Um, again, thus potentially escalating the behavior to a uh, to a criminal offense. Uh, next slide, please. Um, complaint process and opportunities for program feedback. Um, there is currently no complaint process available on the district website. Um, the community can, you can go to the district website and complain about district employees, but the sheriff is not a district employee. Okay, um, there should be a process to complain about the SRD at the school district. Um, and there should also be a process that as to where students and their families um, may know what their rights are and what the legal reper, uh, legal repercussion um, legal repercussions can can possibly be and what their constitutional uh, rights are, you know, because, uh, you know, if there are kids in the bathroom and you walking out the bathroom and there's weed smoke coming out the bathroom and other kids in there, you know, um, and uh, the sheriff or the or the security wants to, you know, search everybody that's, you know, what's what's the student's rights, you know, in that case from being in the right wrong place at the wrong time, you know, um, should they, you know, um, I often feel, you know, they should be able to say, hey, you know, uh, they should be able to contact their parents. You know, what what are the kids' rights? What are the rights of the family in that situation? Uh, thank you very much. Okay, so deputies are LASD employees, okay? And um, the officer is trained by the LASD, not the school district. And the school administration does not discipline the officer. I'm sorry, this is in terms of procedures for retraining, discipline and rotation. So administration doesn't discipline the officer. The officer is not an employee of the district. So I'm not even sure how much say so <laughs> the uh, administrator has over the uh, the officer on campus. Uh, next screen, please. Um, improvements that can be made. Uh, number one, we need a full audit of all of this stuff because the um, the information is funny. The um, the reporting is inconsistent um, to determine the extent of law enforcement referrals and restraints. Um, we want to reprioritize resources to address academic, social, and behavioral and mental health needs of students um, over security. Um, I think if we deal with these things, it will cut down on the need for security. 
um, establish a memorandum of understanding with the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department that defines and limits the scopes of SRO responsibilities, mandates relevant trainings, and includes an evaluation and oversight mechanism, oversight from the actual school. Um, and, you know, so, and also, you know, we need a, we need some, uh, a feedback mechanism because, um, if you complain to the sheriff about the SRO, it's probably not going to go anywhere. Um, that's the uh, next screen, please. Okay. Yeah. LAS needs to be applied. Yeah. Complain, uh, every, uh, website should provide a process to complain. Um, students and families should be educated on their rights. SRD should be, they should be wearing body cameras working on high school campuses and um, require training in various areas such as crisis response, de-escalation strategies, alternative to suspension, restorative practices, data entry and procedures, racial bias, disability related behaviors, and um, manifest determination review best practices. Um, that's what's, that's the sit down that's at um, before uh, a kid is expelled um, and make sure they have all of their, they're getting all of their uh, procedural safeguards through the uh, idea legislation. And also, man, hey, the sheriff has just been in, I mean, they've it just community wide, they've been in violation of the Department of Justice monitors for years. Um, there's no inv uh, indication that it'll change. Um, there's a, I mean, from a rampant gang problem, so much internal stuff going on with the district, with the uh, sheriffs, I'm wrapping it up right now. I think our district should question whether or not they should contract with them at all. And I also think campus sec security, even though, even though it's beyond the scope of this discussion should be in the conversation as well as a security and the SRD kind of complement uh, each other. Um, and uh, that is uh, that is it. Thank you so much for my for my time. Thank you very much, Baron, for your presentation. And next, we'll hear from Rudy Perez, who is the president of the National Association of School Resource Officers. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, good morning. I hope you guys are doing well. My name is Rudy Perez. I am uh, the president of the National Association of School Resource Officers. I also have the privilege of being an assistant chief out here in the um, uh, suburb uh, metropolitan area of, of Minneapolis. And uh, so just thank you for being part of the conversation. Thanks for letting me be here. I just, you know, in my opinion, um, I've done 20, a little bit of history for me. I did 22 years with the Los Angeles School Police Department. I retired out as a lieutenant, uh, one of the greatest agencies in the world with the greatest missions of mentoring and protecting and leading kids safely through high schools uh, in the Los Angeles area. Um, uh, an amazing organization. Uh, unfortunately, I think we we probably have a lot of uh, different of opinions in this in this uh, panel as we are standing here, and that's absolutely okay. Um, I'm absolutely okay with having uh, different thought processes behind this. Um, I'm an immigrant to this country. I immigrated from Guatemala. Uh, my first language is Spanish, and you know I definitely understand the challenges of living. Uh, I lived in 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 the, the projects of uh, Pacoima in the San Fernando Valley when I uh, when I came here at a young age and I have parents that are very, very hard workers. Definitely had my encounters with law enforcement. I definitely saw the challenges uh, and I've seen the progressions uh, in a better way since I became a police officer of where I saw law enforcement start as a kid and treat it as, and, in very challenging ways as a law enforcement uh, in as a kid by law enforcement, but uh, I still see uh, the better outcome of having a land uh, that I came from that did not have law enforcement, that did not care for the safety of their students in the country that I came from. So, which is what pro propelled me to become a law enforcement officer here in this country. Uh, so it did come from very, very humble, humble beginnings um, and am committed to the vision and mission of protecting kids across the country. I, I am the president now of NASRO, uh, which represents thousands and thousands of um, school police officers and SROs and uh, deputies that are, are assigned to schools. And also a massive amount of school mental health and administrators now are part of our organization, which is a pretty powerful uh, tool where you have the administration's mental health workers and SROs working on, on one uh, vision mission is to help with wholeheartedly and uh, wraparound services, 
mental health evaluation thought process of how to mentor and protect our kids safely through graduation. Um, today, I'm just I'm just advocating my voice. It sounds like, uh, you know, I, I believe in the process of having a properly trained officer, a properly selected and properly equipped law enforcement professional on your campuses. And I believe there's an ecosystem. Uh, I grew around I grew around the, the ecosystem in Los Angeles, and we cannot just say we don't need law enforcement anymore. We cannot not say that we we don't care for them anymore. Um, we can turn around and bring a lot of statistics to the table, and then that all can be questioned. Los Angeles suffered a massive amount of defund, uh, and those are things that are now being looked at again. And they are not only in Los Angeles, but I'm telling you right now across the country. Uh, a lot of agencies are saying we want our, res our school resource officers back, not only by school officials, but by parents and also students. Um, I saw a lot of uh, very challenging moments when bad policy, uh, knee jerk policies were created and uh, unintended consequences arose from that. And a lot of our kids became victims of robberies. A lot of our, our victims became, uh, a lot of our children across this nation got hurt and up to killed because of bad policy making. Um, in my opinion, we we do need partnerships. This is not a law enforcement answer only. This is not just cops need to handle the discipline. First of all, cops should never be involved in a discipline aspect in a campus. They should not be involved at all. That this, this should be uh, really vetted through the process of the ecosystem. I am a big advocate of an ecosystem and that ecosystem includes a law enforcement officer. And that law enforcement officer, along with the mental health worker, along with uh, the teachers, the school administrations, um, that's part of the ecosystem, you know. But what we did see, and I can tell you wholeheartedly, and I can show facts, and we have a lot of information um, that says the moment the SRO was removed from campus, uh, everybody and announced to the world we're removing officers from campuses across this country. Crime uh, around schools and in schools started going up. Uh, the sad part was I even saw good students with good grades bringing weapons to school. And when we started questioning them, and I'm talking about weapons from knives and guns, uh, we would say, "Why would you bring a weapon to school? You you are not the typical. Uh, you're a very you're a very good student. You you don't you don't have this this kind of behavior in your, your life." And people were saying, "Look, sir, it's very dangerous to walk to and from school." And we have to acknowledge that we have to acknowledge that tune from schools are very challenging uh, moments for our students. Um, the pandemic set a lot of things in motion that we didn't once again unintended consequences of pandemics and some of the things we saw. Um, there are some great resources and uh, best practices. Uh, there's some great studies on our website. Please go to nasro.org. Uh, it's a great uh, it has a lot of information on there. I can't tell you it's so important to uh, to continue the conversation. Uh, in these aspects, I, I was able to, uh, I'm also elected to sit on the Homeland Security Academic Partnership Council, uh, uh, appointed by Mallorcas this year. Uh, so I'm excited to see the good work that's going to be done from there. Um, but thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, I think the Los Angeles uh, Sheriff's Department can uh, can get a great program going. Uh, they've had, they've been phenomenal supporters of uh organizations. I think, uh, if anything, I would love to see somebody from the um, uh, sheriff's department that runs the SRO unit on this panel. I think they would have a lot of information to say. So it's uh, it's very important to include them in this conversation also. But I am an advocate for the sheriff's department. I grew up, there were great partners with me while I was there. Uh, so continue the conversation. And uh, I always say, when you're not at the table, you'll be on the menu. And it's very important for all of us to sit here at the table and figure it out that uh, our, our students and our staff and our community is very important to us. And how do we come together uh, with an ecosystem? I am I am for more counselors. I am for more um, teachers. I am for more services around uh, our students. But it's not in lieu of removing a police officer from our campus. I think the ecosystem needs a police officer on campus to address the evasive issues that arise from these ecosystems. So. Once again, thank you very much, uh, um, Oversight Commission. Thank you for the time and place. Uh, it's always a pleasure to see new people, and um, I'm happy to hear things. Some things work, some things don't. Uh, I think, uh, as my as my partner Baron said, there's 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 a lot of reporting inconsistency going on, and that is 
across the board in different ways. We're also getting a lot of reports uh, on campuses that are not being reported to law enforcement officers that are mandates by law to your schools. And that is a challenge also. We have to look into these, uh, these things. Uh, I think uh, part of the restorative justice process is also restoring the justice of the victim. Uh, and we can't negate them either because they get victimized also. So I think uh, school administrators, and we are seeing this across the country, uh, school administrators and uh, other administrators are being held responsible for some of these challenges that we are seeing of not reporting crimes that need to be reported. And I think in order for us to once again be part of an ecosystem where we work together, uh, we have to be able to uh, not have these inconsistencies across the board. I, I, I'm also with Mr. Barron, like, hey, let's get the information of what this looks like. What are the, the arrest numbers look like? But uh, I think the inconsistency can come across in various ways. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Rudy. Uh, from a clinical social work perspective, I completely agree with your ecosystem. Uh, and for the record, uh, Monday, I mean, on our first uh, virtual conference session, we did have uh, a sergeant from the Sheriff's Department that provided an excellent overview of, the, of their program. So moving forward, we'll now hear from Jewel Forbes, Los Angeles County Superintendent of Schools. Please take it away. Good morning. And so um, thank you for having me. And first, I just want to introduce myself, Jewel Forbes. I'm a actual project director too with um, mental health and school counseling for the Los Angeles County Office of Education. The Los Angeles County Office of Education um, provides support, technical assistance, and training to all 80 school districts in Los Angeles County. So we have a really big job. And so that is under the direction of Dr. Deborah Duardo, who is our superintendent of schools. And so just a little bit about my background. I've been with the county office as an administrator for about 14 years now. But prior to that, I was a district level director and also a school site high school administrator. So I've worked in this area for quite a few years. Um, and so I'm glad to be a part of this group talking about um, law enforcement on school campuses. And so, um, as you know, in recent years, police presence on the school campus has garnered a lot of attention with many believing that there is no role for law enforcement on school campuses. We've seen many campaigns such as Dignity in Schools, um, No to Cops, Yes to Counselors, and others across the board. I'm sorry, go to the next slide, please. And so many of the things that we see garner attention that is negative toward law enforcement. But on the other side of things, we've also seen in recent years an increase in issues related to school safety, issues related to active shooters and intruders on school campuses. And so you have many asking for increased presence of law enforcement on those schools where we've seen active shooter presence. Next slide. So some of the things we know that have happened are some very harmful patterns. And so we've seen in many instances when there are law enforcement presence on school campuses, there's been more criminalization of youth. Um, we know that a lot of people have had discussions around the school to prison pipeline and how law enforcement on the school campus can add to the school to prison pipeline and impact youth, not only from law enforcement, from the, but those involved in the juvenile justice system. We know that discriminatory practices is also a big issue. Many of you have seen the data that came out from the um, controller's office just recently that talked about 80% of arrests by LAPD have been people of color, black and Latino. And so we really need to pay close attention to making sure that these types of practices are not happening within our schools. Um, we've also seen increased arrests in the last um, few years. Next slide. So um, I know that Barron talked a lot about data and some of the data is the same things that I have listed here. But in a nutshell, we know that black students and Latino students are um, more likely to um, be referred to law enforcement on school campus. We know they are more likely to be arrested. We also know that youth um, with disabilities 
are more likely as well to be arrested. So there's a lot of data, and, and, and so it's important that we look at that data, not as a negative at all times, but to look at how we can improve with the data that we have. So many of the factors that Barron shared in his presentation are some of the same issues that we're dealing with, not only in Antelope Valley, but across Los Angeles County and throughout the state. So um, these slides will be available because I don't want to sit here and read slides to you. Most, most of this data you already know. But when you look at these numbers, when you look at these percentages, it does um, make one um, feel concerned about the safety and well-being of our students. Next slide, please. And so I want to just focus for a moment in the reimagining law enforcement presence in schools and what that might look like and how we might work together to begin to look at this idea. Next slide. And so this really begins, and in my mind, I think about it's a shifting in our narrative. So we've heard so much negative about some of the things that have happened, and there's truth to everything. We know that students have been arrested. We know that black males are usually those who might be targeted on, in and around school campuses. So how do we shift the narrative? How do we begin this, to work together as educators and law enforcement to make sure these types of things aren't happening? And so it begins with many of the points that you see on this screen. How are we clearly defining our role? And I know Barron talked about that as well. Um, establishing appropriate boundaries for law enforcement, looking at collaborative relationships, looking at how are we using data to really drive improvement and reduce um, interactions and discipline on school campuses. And lastly, really focusing on training. And so we're gonna talk about each of those points really quickly um, and talk about how these things are possible. Next slide, please. So let's talk about clearly defining the role. And that seems to be across the board. I'm the third speaker, and I think all of us agree that we really have to come together and clearly define the role of law enforcement in and around school campuses. So what does that look like? That looks like educators, especially administrators, coming together with law enforcement to talk about what is the role of law enforcement on the school campus? What does that look like? I think it needs to have input from both sides. It's something that doesn't have to be written once and then never looked at again. We need to review it annually because things change. Our society has changed. Look how much we've changed since COVID. So what do we need to do? How everyone should have input, not only administration, but teachers, counselors, other school staff have input around what is the role of school law enforcement on our campuses and making sure that we're capturing that, whether it's through a memorandum of understanding or through a contract. We know um, law enforcement on school campuses looks different across the county. So I know we talked about SROs, which are through the sheriff's department, but then there are school districts that have their own school police. And then yet we still have other districts that contract with local police officers. So it looks different throughout our county. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so I think it also talks, we talk about collaborative relationships, right? So we would hope that these things would happen organically, but when it doesn't, we have to really look at it being intentional. And I love the term intentional collaboration because what that means is that we all have a role in building these, these collaborative relationships on the school campus. So what does that look like? That looks like regular team meetings. When I was a high school administrator, every Monday, our administration met with our law enforcement officers, our campus security, and other stakeholders. We talked about what had happened over the weekend that might run over into the school campus. We talked about what was coming up that week, what activities, what safety concerns there might be. So it really begins with that intentional collaboration and having those conversations so that law enforcement is involved in the overall process so they understand. But that doesn't mean they're stepping outside of their role. That means that law enforcement should be part of the school community on campus and off campus. What does that look like? That means they're engaged in school activities, but not in a disciplinary manner. That means they're involved in community events. There is something that they can bring to the table and they have added bonus, but it has to be reflected in the community. We have to find ways to build trust with law enforcement. Not all officers are bad. We can look at statistics all day long, but we know there's good and bad everywhere. Next slide. So here are some of the possible areas of involvement for law enforcement. One, school-wide trainings. Most schools do training every month school-wide with teachers and other staff, paraprofessionals, everyone on the school campus. 
involve law enforcement in some of those trainings. I think that they could benefit from that information. Oftentimes, law enforcement come into school campuses and they don't know the lay of the land. They don't know the climate. They don't know the procedures. So we need to make sure that they are aware of that. Also, the safety, the overall safety process. That's why we want law enforcement on campus. So are you involving them in the comprehensive safe school planning? Make sure they're a member of that team. They have valuable input. Um, many times law enforcement come with active shooter training background. So they can be very active if you're doing active shooter drills on campus. Involve them in the overall school climate. I know that when we ever we had a, um, a crisis on our school campus, our law enforcement assisted as liaisons with other civic organizations. For instance, if, if fire department or the local sheriff's department had to come on campus, our school police served as that liaison to lead them across the campus where they might need to go. Who better to know the lay of the land and understand the map of your school campus? So this is a valuable way that they can serve and support the overall school environment. Next slide. And then to look at how are we using data? As educators, we collect data on everything. So why are we not using the data on arrest, on citations, to really look at the areas and the gaps in our systems? So that means, when are we calling law enforcement? Understanding, as educators, or, or as administrators, are we involving law enforcement in the overall disciplinary process when they shouldn't be notified? We should be notifying law enforcement when things rise to a level of a crime or an extreme safety issue. As administrators, we shouldn't be calling law enforcement to help do our job in the disciplinary actions. So we wanna make sure that those roles are clearly defined. And then looking at, instead of calling law enforcement, are we involving other resources that are community-based or school-based, such as the Trauma Prevention Initiative, or using credible messengers with those lived experience to address gang violence or other types of violence? There are resources. I heard somebody mention um, PBIS. There are mental health um, practitioners, all types of school-based and community-based resources that we can be tapping into um, before we engage with law enforcement. So we have to be looking at those things. And that means that we're looking at the data and targeting those areas each year as a team. Next slide. And I wanna really focus most of the, the, my last moments in this area. The critical component has to be training. As I mentioned before, often when law enforcement officers come on campus or are placed on campuses, they don't have the same training that we've received as educators. So we have to begin to look at where are their gaps and how can we help them understand not only student behavior, but youth development and, and anything that affects the behavior of our youth. Youth mental health first aid is critical for law enforcement. This is a training that anyone can receive. It's not for mental health professionals. Um, it's for lay staff to understand what types of mental health issues we're seeing in youth, what are the um, actions and behaviors we see, um, how um, you might see that show up at school every day in the behaviors of students. But we also know our students are showing up with high levels of trauma. So we want officers to be trained in trauma-informed practices. Students are experiencing adverse childhood experiences, not one or two, but multiple. And so even post-pandemic, we're seeing increased behaviors, increased needs for mental health across the county and across the nation. So we wanna make sure that law enforcement understands that because oftentimes mental health issues are acted out in behavior. Another component of has to be equity and social justice work. We have to make sure that law enforcement understands the communities they serve. And that means understanding the ethnicity, the race, the culture, the climate that they're working in. Maybe those are not the same norms that they share, but making sure they're trained and they understand that. And, and so that allows them to have better communication, not only with students, but with parents. We know that many law enforcement agencies have now implemented implicit bias across the board, but having one-time implicit bias is not enough. It should be ongoing. I know within our organization, we've had implicit bias 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, because things change and we need a higher level of training to understand what are our biases? We all show up with biases, but what are my biases? And understanding how that relates to the work that I do. 
We want law enforcement to really understand youth behavior, so mean, meaning youth mindset and behaviors, the brain development of youth. We know that sometimes youth are not making good choices because their brains are not fully developed. Those are simple trainings that we can implement to assist law enforcement in their decision making when they are involved with youth. We know that law enforcement is also trained in crisis response, but is it the same crisis response we see receive as educators? So that means, are you aware that there's a psychiatric mobile response team when there's a suicidal student? Are you aware of START, which is the school threat assessment and response team? Are you aware of school-based mental health referrals? Are you working with the school counselors, you know, to address some of those issues? You know, how are we showing up and how are we working together in that collaborative way so that we can reduce some of the harmful patterns that have been created on school campus that are affecting, especially youth of color. And so we want to begin to have those conversations. I want to share my um, my contact information. If anybody wants to have this conversation, we look forward to continued conversations on this topic. Um, I do believe that there is a role for law enforcement on our school campuses, but I do believe that we really need to come to the table and clearly define that role. So thank you, and I'll stop there. Thank you, Ms. Forrest, for this excellent presentation. And now we'll hear from Amir Whitaker, who is the Senior Policy Counsel for the American Civil Liberties Union. Morning, everyone. Thank you for hosting this conversation and thank you for the opportunity to speak on this matter. Uh, next slide, please. I'm going to start with a little bit about myself and the perspective I'll be speaking from. Um, so it'll be both personal, professional, and then also including some of my research experience. A little more about me. So I've been a credentialed teacher in three states, including California, and worked in schools throughout um, Los Angeles, but also in Florida and New Jersey, my home state where I'm from originally. I'm currently senior policy counsel with the ACLU of Southern California, uh, he and his, but before that I was a researcher with the UCLA Civil Rights Project and I authored several reports um, with SRO data. Actually, the, the report, some of the numbers that Jewel just shared um, came from one of my reports, um, but I looked at national data, federal, you know, federal level, state level, county level, district and school level data. Um, I've also represented students and families in this, what we know as the school to prison pipeline. And I myself was a survivor, am a survivor of this pipeline. I've been arrested uh, at one point, pushed out of school. For years, I thought I dropped out of school, but once getting my doctorate in educational psychology, I realized the school actually created a climate that made me not want to come to school. And for some students, uh, law enforcement, the presence of law enforcement um, and their practices are, are a part of that. Um, next slide, please. So I also wanted to just share a little bit of history and context too of how we get here that this also informs and frames some of um, our comments and recommendations. Um, so back in 1948, just a few generations ago, this is um, when here in Los Angeles, the, the Los Angeles School Police Department had its roots. And it started when the school started to newly integrate and um, the fear of black students and black families prompted the, the uh, initial security force and uh, school police force. But still by 1975, only 1% 1 of schools had SROs or SRDs and my apologies, I'm just gonna use them interchangeably. Um, you know, 1% of schools, but by 2005, that grew to 42% of schools. And by 2020, or some of the most recent data, you know, shows 67% or two out of three schools. Um, so how in the, in, in 1975, there were literally less than 200 school police officers, but now there are over 40,000 school police officers. Um, and we've seen that um, school shootings usually trigger this investment in this, um, you know, in, in school police officers, but also the role of school police officers as we're even seeing here and hearing about here on this presentation has evolved, you know, from protector or um, as the county contract says to enforce the law but it's, it's shifting more to, you know, mentor, educator, um, supporter of mental health and, and different things. And um, just always wanna go back to the original mission of, of um, what we are investing and in supporting students for. Uh, next slide, please. 
Uh, so here are some links and some things related to a, a report I published at the ACLU in 2019. So this was before the 2020 uprisings. Uh, we were already looking at this issue, but after the uprisings, um, our now current vice president, Kamala Harris, but then our, our senator, she retweeted one of my, uh, st st the statistics we found in the report that found, you know, 1.7 million students in schools with police and no counselor. Um, up to 10 million students in schools with police and no social worker, if you look at the bottom of her tweet. And she said, we need systematic change now. And this was retweeted, you know, over a thousand times and like thousands of times. Fortunately, she's since um, deleted the tweet and the federal government has invested uh, just in October, $190 million into school police and grants and different things like that. So um, things are reversing course. However, on the top right of the, um, the slide, you can see what I extracted from this data just for LA County. So we published this report in 2019 and looked at all schools, all 50 million students across the country and how this issue impacted them. But here in LA County, school police um, and mental health across Los Angeles County, there are over 400,000 students or about 30% of school um, students in LA County are enrolled in schools with police, but either have a no nurse, uh, counselor, social worker, and or school psychologist. So one of those four are missing and it's usually the social worker. And I know Luis, you're a clinical social worker and there are so many schools in throughout LA County that might have a SRD, an SRO, whatever, but there's no social worker. And that's just part of the, um, how we're configuring schools now. And that's a travesty because, I mean, I know at ACLU we've represented students and this was related to a Riverside, uh, a lawsuit against Riverside County. Um, but one of our students was grieving and one of our clients and they were in school and the school didn't have a social worker. So they were assigned probation or given a referral to law enforcement. And literally it said crime on the school's form and um, the crime said grief. And the student just was going through the process of losing, you know, an elder um, and was responded to with law enforcement in programs. Um, so I, I included the link to this slide um, that, that was at the beginning, and I'm sorry I didn't state that um, at first, but there are different links and different videos that you can watch more and, and I don't have the time to talk about now. Um, but next slide, please. So nine studies, I want to get straight to the research on SRDs or SROs and their impact directly on student outcomes. Um, the first I want to bring up is a West Ed study from 2018 that found there's no conclusive evidence that the presence of school-based law enforcement has a positive impact on students. Um, another study found school policing strategies have no overall impact on crime or discipline. And this was a three-year study that also found school police have no impact on bullying. Um, this, the study found that it has the opposite effect. You know, school police alienate, search students, increase surveillance, and, and harm school climate. The presence of school police can lead to poor academic outcomes, particularly among, among black boys. Um, and research found a correlation between school police and higher rates of exclusionary discipline uh, with students of color. So in the last study I'll share, one of the last ones is, is a study in Texas found uh, schools receiving federal funding from 1999 to 2008 experienced a 2.5% decrease in the graduation rates, decrease in college enrollment rates, and increase in middle school discipline rates compared to those schools that did not receive. You know, so that's a really important study. It looked at the schools that received these federal grants and the schools that did not, and the schools that received and increased school police saw these decrease in outcomes. And we also know students with disabilities, LGBTQ plus and, and others, as, as Baron mentioned, 60% of, of students in the Anno Valley Black Boys in special education. Um, and then the last study I'll share is, you know, casualties of can actually increase with school police. One study looked at over 133 cases of school shootings, and this is um, linked in the PowerPoint. Um, but between 1980 and 2009, they found that the presence of school police could actually increase. And I encourage you all to go to nzerotolerance.org where you can find um, more of these research and studies. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so one of the more recent reports we published back in 2021 that looked at California data and looked at what was happening in LA County, um, it was called No Police in Schools, and that's linked as well. Um, and in this, we examine what's called the RIPA data, with, uh, which the sheriff and you know other law enforcement agencies are now required to report. But we also looked at the federal CRDC data to see if the presence of law enforcement um, or the rates of arrests at schools with law enforcement were higher than those without. And that's what these charts here indicate. For example, with all students, you can see um, 
the arrest rate with in schools without law enforcement was, you know, 0.1, but schools with law enforcement was about 0.6. So it's about six times as higher. And I know that might seem like a small number, but again, all it takes is one arrest to derail a student's life. Um, but students across all categories are more likely to be arrested in school with law enforcement. Next slide, please. Um, but we also, in this report, I really encourage you to look at a case study we did here in LA County at Baldwin Park Unified. So in 2010 to 2017, the, the VPU, you know, they had no police on staff. 2016, um, they reported 114 referrals to law enforcement. And then 2017, they added six officers. Um, and you see the number of referrals to law enforcement tripled, you know, um, at this time. And then at the bottom right, there's a study that was done in 2019 that also show, show the same thing, just the presence of law enforcement really increases arrests. Um, even for disorderly conduct, especially, you can see there. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, my apologies for going through this so fast because it's a lot of numbers. I'm a researcher. I just tried to include all of this stuff. Um, but the California racial profiling data, looking at police stops in schools show you know, that staff are calling schools for policy violations, even education code violations, which is not criminal conduct and reasonable suspicion for violating a crime. And you see at the top chart, it shows um, the actions that police take during a stop, you know, disproportionately the, the, the more violent things like handcuffs and um, detainment are used against black students who 27% were handcuffed um, compared to 12% of white students, you know, um, also, you know, student searches and other things like this. So black students aren't just more likely to experience law enforcement, but also more likely to experience certain outcomes. Um, and you can see that with the bottom chart as well. But here's just more information about um, some of the findings from our report that I don't have time to go through. I'll just go through one more slide and I'm going to wrap up here. Um, well, this is just a list of things from our ACLU report that you can find. And it's just some of the reasons that students get arrested, um, whether it's, you know, literally carrying a maple leaf, um, talk, talking, taking a milk carton, you know, um, just different things we've actually documented and all of them have a uh, reference included. Um, so that includes my time for today. And, and thank you all um, for this conversation. Oh, one last thing. I'm sorry. The criminalization of mental health really briefly, because in Los Angeles Unified, this chart in this UCLA report confirms that actually the most common uh, reason that school police are called is related to mental health. Um, and we need to understand that although we can train police to respond to mental health, it's really important to have mental health clinicians and practitioners respond. And at the bottom left, you see um, something from NAMI, you know, National Alliance for Mental Illness. And they say people experiencing mental health crisis deserve help, not handcuffs. And that should most definitely extends to our students because police responding can actually increase trauma and stigma. Um, thank you all for your time. Oh, and there's there's the resources linked as well for all these reports and it will be shared. And last thing I have to say, because California has the distinction of having some of our young people killed by or murdered by school police um, and, and security. And, you know, just want to say her name, Mona Rodriguez, the, the 18 year old who was um, murdered in Long Beach by a school officer who had some of the training that we're talking about that increases their effectiveness, still sent the bullet flying through a window as they were leaving the scene. Um, thank you for your time. Mayor, just let it be known that was not a police officer. Or an armed security guard with the training and authority of a police officer. Thank you, Mayor. And I'd like to thank all the speakers here for providing the information related to deputies in schools. Your perspectives have been very insightful. As the commission reviews this issue, the information that each of you provided is invaluable. There are so many nuances to the topic of deputies in schools, and our continued conversation will help us bring to help bring us to solutions. Before we jump into questions from the public, I'd like to ask the panelists a few questions. But first, allow me to briefly share a little bit of my own personal experiences. I'd like to thank Amir and Rudy for sharing your life experiences and what led you on the path where you're at now. Uh, when I was in high school many, many years ago, uh, our, uh, we didn't have a school resource deputy back pro program back then, but what we did have was uh, a deputy who patrolled and who would come to the, our high school and uh, ride with the, the guidance counselor. And one time I was uh, going with a fellow classmate on my little Vespa scooter and uh, that deputy pulled us over 
and alleged that I threw uh, my my classmate that I was riding on the back of my scooter had threw a beer can. It was false. Uh, it was untrue. And nevertheless, I got a ticket for littering and I had to go to juvenile court with my father, uh, who was a, a deputy probation officer. And um, that definitely never showed up. But I share that story because, you know, that guidance counselor was in the car and that guidance counselor was notorious for for singling out students. And, you know, that's from the school administration component. Uh, and, you know, the, the deputy, you know, just that, that was through whatever partnership that they had back then at the time. You know, today there is a formalized uh, contract with the school district that um, my stepsons uh, uh, attend. However, very much like um, was shared by Ms. Forbes, uh, this district partners with the local district and then two schools are partnered with the sheriffs. And there has been some, some, you know, some issues that I have delved into locally here. So I just set that context because, you know, as I heard uh, the reimagining um, focused from Ms. Forbes, and my first question will be directed towards Ms. Forbes. In your that your presentation, you discussed the reimagining, and can you elaborate on how school districts, you know, that that uh, are how school districts have um, responded? to this initiative from the LACO perspective? You know, that's such a great question. And I think how we've responded is one, to have increased communication. I know in the um, past five years, there has been a lot of focus around the presence um, from our board of supervisors. There was actually a board motion in 2018 um, that asked for a response around school resource officers and looking at their role on the school campus and clarifying that role. Um, previous years, no one had asked those questions. So as administrators, we didn't have input into the role of law enforcement. And so I think that board response caused us all to kind of look at what are the possibilities? How can we change things? I know that, I know Amir talked about that as part of his research, but we looked at areas like Antelope Valley and Lancaster where we saw some real issues happening. And now if you look at some of the relationships they have in that area, they've improved. They're not perfect, but they've improved with law enforcement on school campuses. And so there are districts that are doing it really well. And so we be, have to begin with, like I said, bringing both sides to the table, really looking at how administrators can support law enforcement, how law enforcement can support administrators. It really is around clarifying roles and staying in our own lane. You know, law enforcement are involved in way too many things on school campuses that don't involve um, breaking the law, right? So they're called in to do part of a job that should be housed with, with administrators. And so we have to be really careful about that. And I think that's happened because oftentimes schools are shorthanded. And yeah, we are dealing with a lot of mental health crises and a lot of behavior crisis, but that doesn't mean we need to link them with law enforcement. That means we need to link them with the appropriate agencies that can provide the right types of services, whether it's mental health, whether it's anger management, whether it's PBIS, whatever that looks like for that student. So I hope that kind of answers the question. Yes, thank you. Uh, my next question will be for uh, Rudy. And I, you know, I, when I heard your presentation and you shared about this ecosystem uh, lens, you know, I, I, when I see, when I see that importance of having assigned, you know, when everybody in a, a, a academic or school setting has their identified roles, you know, we, we, I think we can see improved outcomes across, you know, the, the, the school setting. Um, in your experience, uh, as you know, from the National Association's perspective, you know, I was particularly uh, intrigued by the definition of the SRO that the association um, provides. And, you know, one of the key things was, you know, specifically being trained and carefully selected uh, and trained in school-based law enforcement. And from what it sounds like from, from uh, reports that have been done by the Office of Inspector General, and, and from other community-based groups and some agencies. Uh, it appears here in LA County, the, the 
this lines of accountability has been an area that needs some improvement. Uh, can you speak to you know how your your association provides uh, guidance? You know, I, I think is what I'm looking for to to agencies on around these areas. Yeah, yeah, I think it's it's once again it's it's very important, and I keep reiterating it's properly selected, properly trained, properly equipped, and that is a law enforcement officer. That's what I am talking about—a law enforcement officer, a sworn law enforcement officer specifically uh, as you know and, and and forgive me if if it was at a place but you know I and, and there's no intention ill intention of Mr. Amir talking about uh, the death of, of that young lady and that was a tragic horrible thing and the moment I saw that that was horrific but I but I I had to speak on that because that is a perfect example of having somebody that's not properly trained that's not properly selected to understand that this is, look, why are we getting involved in the type of crime that we don't need to? So some of the, the key important things that we are now talking to is agencies like the cops office nationwide, that you got to have policies in place going, why are, why do we use our school resource officers? What are the, where are the areas that people can come back and say, uh, I think it was, I, I, I'm almost sure it was, um, maybe Jew, Ms. Jewel said it, or Mr. Barron says, where do we have something in place where people can say, hey, we have a concern in regards to an issue that arose during the, the SRO contact. Where, where do we have that? And I think uh, our conversation has been those agencies have to have something within the school district or, or have the school administrator saying the direction, this is the direction you need to go to this place or website or location or take the complaint and, or, and take it into a supervisor to come in and uh, take that complaint uh, if, if that's what it arises to. So we are advocating and best practice, I don't even want to say best practices anymore, current practices. I think it's important to say what's current in Los Angeles might not work for another small state. It's just, it just doesn't work that way. So I think current practices across this country need to be shared um, and, uh, and policies, MOUs need to be shared. I think we are gonna gather a lot of information where school districts now are saying, hey, Nasra, do you guys have MOUs, samples of good MOUs? Do you have samples of good uh, working relationships? Is there an, an alternative way to use a police officer? Uh, do we have them on campus? Do we not have them on campus? Do we have them as a re re support response services? Uh, those are the kind of conversations we are now having with uh, more organizations like the cops office, the DOJ. Uh, they're saying, well, what do, what does this really look like? Um, so it's, I think uh, Ms. Jewell said it, this is an ongoing process. This is not going to be, hey, this is done and said all. I think we got to go back to it. And it's a it's a living document, and if you have to adjust it for your city, for your areas, please do so to address the issue. At the end of it, we mentor, lead, and protect kids safely through graduation, and that ecosystem includes everybody, not only us. Thank you. And, and my next question for, it would be for Baron. Uh, we've got a few minutes. Uh, so, as a teacher in the Antelope Valley, um, and I, you know, you pointed out the 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 challenges that have been going on there and and in particular within the school districts. Uh, have, do you have or can you share like some of the like I guess from from what you're seeing firsthand from like students and, and their their perceptions of the school resource deputies on campus? Um <clears throat> the uh, students generally speaking I mean, it runs the gamut, but they're generally, uh, how do I put it, man? They're generally uh, indifferent. Um, the average student walks or walking around campus. I mean, if that's what you're asking me, the average student walking around campus is not necessarily thinking about the uh, the SRO. I mean, they did a, um, our school did a survey because there was a little stir around the, um, the role of the SRO on campus. And they did a, uh, our, our school did a survey asking students what they thought about the the officer on campus if they wanted to talk to them or something like that um and they're just largely kind of indifferent you know but um <clears throat> i think to some of our kids the police uh, presence can be uh can be 
uh, can be triggering. You know, um, this is Antelope Valley, man. A lot of the students up here are basically, you know, economic refugees, man, if you will, pushed out of the, uh, basically pushed out of the cities and forced up here. And, um, you know, man, many of these kids, I've spoken to many students, they, they've seen their parents taken away by, uh, by the police. I had a young girl who told me a story about how the police came in her home and uh, beat her mama up and her mama lost her baby. Just a lot of stuff, man. You, you know, we have a, a subset of students, you know, from Los Angeles um, who are who are up here, man, and can really be uh, be triggered by the uh, by the presence of the police, by the big old gun. You know what I'm saying? Um, that 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 type of thing, man. So it, it really runs the gamut. But uh, you know, general generally speaking, most students aren't aren't worried or don't you know are, are you know are indifferent to the to the presence of the police in in general. Um, you notice they do have a there are a couple kids that want to be cops and they form relationships with the with the police officer. But generally speaking. The SRO, you know, that I've seen, um, I mean, they don't do a whole lot. You know, they don't they don't do a whole lot. It's not like they cowboys out there. That's not part of their job description. They just kind of they're they're around and available. I mean, um, what I mean, somebody brought up school shooters and just I mean, you know, these things need to be laid out, man. What role have the police played nationwide with school shooters uh, since this has been? An issue. I mean, it's not their job to be, you know, they don't jump out and be cowboys, you know. Um, we had a situation out here when we did have a school shooter and uh, the police were called and the situation was handled. It's not like the um, the SRO on campus made a, uh, a huge difference. We, we're all familiar with Uvalde in Texas. We're, we're in the Parkland, Florida. The, the federal court said that the police have no obligation to protect anybody. So, you know, their, their, their role has to be defined. And right now, most students are kind of uh, indifferent. And we have to rethink, man, our, in, in, in our district, man, we got a $1.9 million contract with the uh with the sheriff man and i i want to question this man i'm sorry if i'm take if i'm taking a little bit but i want to address a couple things um what man we're in the area out here man where the department of justice is monitoring the cops for racism for use of force we've had whistleblowers come out that dude reynoso talk about the cops uh, 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 systematically going out to harass black people and referring to it as hunting and then body slamming uh, irate young ladies on campus. Uh, you know, they, they have a, a, a gang problem. What are they bringing to this ecosystem? You know what I'm saying? Are they bringing a positive, you know, thing to this ecosystem? You know, that's something that we need to, that we need to be considering, man, and what the school safety uh, look like and what role are the police playing and what role do we want them to play or do they even have a role? I mean, these are, I mean, I'm, I'm repeating the big questions that, um, that, that people are asking. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to open this up to the live Q and a portion. Uh, Jennifer, are there any community questions for the panel? Yes, um, as a reminder, if you're logged into WebEx to ask a question, please raise your hand. If you have called in, you can press star three to get in queue to be unmuted. I will unmute you when it's your turn so that you can ask your question. And if your question is for a specific panelist, please feel free to state that. To ask your question, you have to be logged into WebEx or phoned into the meeting. If you comment on fa the Facebook Live video, your question may be read out loud by the host. And before we begin, we will have a quick announcement in Spanish. Daniel, please go ahead. Sorry, I had to mute myself. Uh, buenos días. Si ha iniciado la conferencia por WebEx y le gustaría hacer un comentario o pregunta sobre el tema, por favor, oprima la imagen de la mano y alguien le ayudará. Si está escuchando la conferencia por teléfono y le gustaría hacer un comentario o pregunta, por favor, oprima la tecla de la estrella y el número 3. 
y alguien le ayudará cuando sea su turno. Si está viendo la conferencia en vivo por Facebook y ha escrito un comentario o pregunta, la coordinadora de la conferencia va a leer su comentario al grupo. Por fin, si su pregunta es para una, un panelista específico, por favor indique eso al comienzo de su pregunta. Gracias. Thank you, Daniel. Um, and just as a reminder, this is for questions, so there won't, will not be a timer um, because it is not a public comment. And we have our first question has been sent in through the chat. It's from Shanna, so I'll be reading that out loud. It says, how are students involved in reimagining? My high school student was at LA USD High School with school groups actively advocating for the removal of SROs and LAUSD PD. And though some parents wanted SROs and others did not, it seemed that the students were not involved in the grown up conversations. Are there youth representatives on the Civilian Oversight Commission at this time? So, uh, coming as a staff from the commission, we do not have any commissioners who are youth, but we are working with other commissions and agencies, such as the Human Relations Commission and the Youth Commission to try to receive public feedback related to this um, issue. And we do have the open public comment on our website, which we're hoping to get additional um, feedback from high school students. And I would just like to open up this uh, question to the panelists. If anyone can provide information on how we're actually receiving feedback from the youth who are in schools, that would be very valuable. I can speak up on that. At least uh, in my local community, um, you have um, a group called Cancel the Contract, and they reach out and uh, have done some organizing with uh, with students on campus, with the uh, the free the Freedom March squad. And um, and uh, and, and having student representatives at um, at meetings, and I've seen community meetings with students, not only with students but with uh, with parents as well. Um, and of course, this is difficult work; it needs to expand. We need more students and more parents in the mix. But I've seen um, an effort uh, from the from the from community organizations to uh, to involve to involve students. And I'll just add to what Baron just said. Um, never in my time in education have I seen youth that are so politically active. And I'm so proud of them for taking the lead. And so we're seeing youth advisories across the county. I think that it needs to increase, but we are seeing youth that are really um, expressing their voice, expressing their feelings on school campuses. Um, you know, one of the many campuses are creating safe spaces like dream centers is one of those examples where youth can come together and talk about issues that they are dealing with that are affecting their communities. And so we want to see um, those types of safe spaces available across the entire county of Los Angeles in the in the years to come. You know, I was there when uh, the the inquiry of a lot of. Um, uh, information from parents and students were asked, uh, I believe it was under the direction of Austin Butner, the superintendent that he did take an, an inquiry to parents and students. And I believe uh, at the end of it, it did support the issues of having policing, but with the reimagination thought process of what shall it look like. Uh, at least when I was in Los Angeles, we also did the student bill of rights and the school police department was the first ones to help uh, pioneer that with with the school board. So that was a uh, part of also including students in that conversation. And uh, I'm not sure if if you were part of that or there at all. Just FYI. Awesome. Thank you. And so for the next question, we'll go to Vanessa Perez. Vanessa, if you can acknowledge the unmute request. OK, please go ahead with your question, Vanessa. Vanessa, I see that you're unmuted, but we do not hear you. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we do. Okay, uh, my name is Vanessa Perez. I'm the mother of Joseph Perez, who was beat by the sheriffs. Um, I can't stress it enough. It doesn't matter how much training these deputies get. If they're problematic on the street, then they'll be problematic in our schools. Um, I heard properly selected 
is there no color coded chart that shows problematic deputy behavior prior to their hiring and putting in our schools? Like Deputy Paul Saldana, how did he get into my daughter's high school? It's, it's just unbelievable. There's so thank question. you, Vanessa, if you could just um, repeat your question. I don't know if it's for a specific panelist or if any of them might be able to chime in on it. Um, like, is there no color coded chart that shows uh, problematic behavior from these deputies before they're put into our schools? Um, Do any of the panelists have any thoughts or comments on that um, about I, screening? I, as a law enforcement officer here, I, I don't know if they have anything like that, ma'am. Uh, but I, I, yeah, I couldn't speak on to what their process is. And generally, generally speaking, um, generally speaking, that, that, that kind of, kind of stuff is highly, it's not public It's highly secretive. And I, we've asked the same questions before, especially here in LASD. Um, there's been a lot of concerns with the uh, with the sheriff gangs, and I'm, you know, we've been discussing that in my dish. How do we know who these people are? Are they involved in these sheriff gangs? What gangs are are active in our in our um, you know in our sheriff er area? And we've had a couple. We've had situations with uh, you know uh, police brutality on uh, you know upon students as as, as well. But um, yeah, it's highly. We don't we don't have access to that type of information, and I doubt that the schools actually do. Um, the school that the, their LASD employees at the school site, and the schools basically, I mean, they can't discipline them and don't have any. You know, so I'm I'm quite sure that they don't have any information on their history um, before they before they pop up. If somebody with a little more knowledge can speak up on it, that would be great. Okay, thank you very much for that, Baron. And this kind of leads into the next question that was sent in, and that's does um, any one of the panelists have any written documentation of best practices for having officers in schools? Yeah, I, I actually added a lot of links to their, uh, uh, so you I feel free to share those. There's a lot of good stuff that we've been working on recently on best practices and, and current practices that you can uh, have uh, properly selected. What are you looking? What are the attributes of a school SRO? Uh, and those are those are those are important. I'll tell you one thing. I I train hundreds of SROs across the country, and now even across the world. The the fact that uh, Brazil and the country of Georgia, uh, you have the U.S. Virgin Islands, uh, you have uh, the United Arab Emirates. They're all interested in how to get engaged in early prevention, early intervention process, and they've been members on that. But one thing I tell you right now, and I tell police officers this all the time, I say, if you don't like kids, if you don't like being around kids, don't be an SRO. You're going to be a problem. And and I have no problem telling uh, school resource officers that. And this is this is a place that if, this is not a, 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 a position where we're out there trying to 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 do wrong. I'll tell you one thing, 95% of my time I spent mentoring. I was part of I was one of the coaches we had a lot of activities we did after. I did a lot of, we we issued over 2,000 turkeys to students and gave thousands and thousands of backpacks and school supplies right now during, during uh, right before school started again. And all of that came from, from the police officers in Los Angeles. They gave from their money. So there's a lot of good police officers out there. There's a lot of good content and a lot of uh, information. Once again, I'll tell you, nasro.org uh, has a lot of good information you can go to. Thank you. And uh, Jewel and Amir and Baron, did any of you have specific uh, documentation that you're aware of that's been published related to best practices for officers in schools from your organizations? Um, no, our, uh, our, our, you know, our response has been largely, um, largely in response to what what we've uh you know to what we've seen um and again we don't even have accurate uh we don't even have accurate documentation um so no we we don't have any documentation of what the best practices would be i mean we can discuss uh we can imagine what it it could be but um you know we would have to have observed and seen those 
and seeing those best practices uh, in action. And, and I'll just add thank you for that and also in agreement. And it depends on what we're looking on the best, best practices for. For example, in, in Broward, <clears throat> excuse me, in Broward County, while I was there in Florida, they were held up as a model for having this MOU that it really helped to decrease um, interactions with law enforcement, the, the referrals, the arrest rates and different things. It didn't really help in terms of disparities, but just clarifying that law enforcement should not be responding to school discipline and different things that happened in Broward County actually did help. Um, many of the organizations we work with are not endorsers of these sort of documents because they also help solidify uh, law enforcement. And in Broward's situation, if we're measuring success in terms of um, response to emergencies, um, as Baron mentioned earlier, you know, the the Parkland shooting that happened there um, is evidence that maybe it wasn't a best practice for that, but it did help to reduce some of the interaction with law enforcement. And I just dropped um, my presentation link in the chat that the last slide has um, links to different reports and resources. And I'll just add to that, we do not have anything related to best practices. What we do have is um, our response regarding um, the board motion, <clears throat> but it really is talking about how to utilize other types of community supports in place of law enforcement um, you know, involvement, meaning utilizing mental health services and some of the things I mentioned earlier um, to really drive some of the incidents that are happening on school campuses. Well, thank you. And then the very last question that was sent in is actually for you, Jewel. It says, uh, what is LACO's jurisdiction to make a uh, change in districts throughout Los Angeles County? So I'm glad that's such a great question because we get this question all the time because I think a lot of people believe that um, LA County Office of Education oversees the 80 school districts. We do not. We provide guidance. We provide support, we provide training. Um, a lot of the staff at LACO have specialty areas, like for me, that's counseling, that's mental health, that's violence prevention, that's anti-hate. And so we help support schools, but a lot of what we do is make sure that we help them understand new legislation that impacts schools. And so LACO does a lot of partnerships, especially county partnerships, with other county offices. Um, we work very closely with Office of Violence Prevention, who I know is on this call today, with um, the Trauma Prevention Initiative and other um, areas of violence prevention, gun safety, and issues like that. We also work with Department of Mental Health. Um, and all of that is done to support overall school process and really supporting students and the school community. So I hope that answers the question, but I know a lot of people wonder like, what does LACO do? And so we really do, you know, if you think about the arms are that we have the California Department of Education at the state level, and then we have county offices across California, you know, Orange County, San Diego County, Los Angeles County that supports schools. And then you have our local school districts along with many charters and private schools as well. So I hope that helps kind of understand like what our responsibility is, but, um, we always have students at the forefront. And so we deal with safety um, as one of our main priorities at all levels, whether it's mental health, whether it's law enforcement, all of those different entities tying together and working together to try to reduce incidents that um, put students at harm. Thank you very much for that, Jewel. And I know we just have about two minutes left in the conference, but I see that Norit has raised your hand. Please go ahead with your question and hopefully we'll get an answer in real quickly. Hi, I guess. Thank you. So I have kind of a two part question. So one being, you know, I think we can all agree that oversight and accountability are constructive um, for really all institutions, um, seeing as we're all here today. Um, so just really connecting with Vanessa's question, um, just wondering about what plans are for continued accountability. So um, if officers continue to be a part of the fabric of our school communities, what are the plans for continued accountability, continued um, transparency with accountability, um, and especially on the student level? I think there should be ways that students can provide feedback on SROs, and one, for people in the community to be able to track that, and two, for officers who are maybe acting beyond the bounds of what the agreed upon um, standards are to be removed or, you know, to be, um, yeah, just 
you know, held responsible for their actions. And then the second part was really just a logistical thing. Um, I haven't received any of the chat messages. I was really um, wanting to just read more about the presentation Amir mentioned that he shared, and then also um, the contact information for um, Ms. Forbes. Sure, Nora. So I'll just chime in there. Um, for all of the presentations, those will be posted and linked from the commission's website, which is coc.lacounty.gov. And uh, for anyone wanting to follow up with the panelists or vice versa, you can email us at cocnotify at coc.lacounty.gov and we'll put you in touch with the intended person. So uh, thank you very much for that question. And uh, Luis, I will turn it back to you. Thank you. <clears throat> to each of our panelists for sharing your thoughts and to the community members for tuning into this important conversation hosted by the Civilian Oversight Commission. This series has helped me better understand the role of deputies in schools and the need for greater accountability in these contracts with school districts so the students can attend schools in a climate where they feel safe. Although this is our final education Educational conference on this topic, we are still holding additional roundtable sessions, so please reach out if you'd like to provide your feedback. We will also be accepting written public comment until August 7th. Our next commission meeting is September 21st, and we look forward to seeing you then. Please visit, visit our website at coc.lacounty.gov to provide written public comment. Watch videos of the conference series and RSVP for our commission meeting. Thank you everyone and have a wonderful day. This concludes our conference.